today, today is our final day here at the Fox Store. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, hey, oh, hey. <laughs> kind, of a, kind of a thing. It was, uh, how many, were, I'm just curious, how many were here day one? How many were here day one? There we go. We have a number of you were here day one. Uh, we've been here since day one, January 27th. I saw you there. Yeah, January. What about in thought? What about the what? What about in thought? In thought. In thought. You were here in thought. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. You were here in spirit, right? Like Apostle Paul. Uh, we were here day one. The Foxhole has been phenomenal. We just want to say a huge shout out to Tim and the owners here at the Foxhole. They've treated us so kindly. They've allowed us to come in and utilize their space. And uh, it's, it's just been neat to kind of watch what God's done as we've grown, as we've expanded, as we need to uh, really make room for more kids. We need um, our kids' space to be a phenomenal area where they can just experience God in their own regard. And we need to make room for more people as well as we continue to grow and expand. So this is our final Sunday here at the Fox Soul. Everybody, you may, not, you may have never met this lady in our church, but if you could, we affectionately refer to this lady as... Foxy, right back in the back. She's wearing a lampshade. She's not real, but we affectionately call her Foxy, and we're gonna turn, turn. She, she, she you know, we we light her up every, every week. Today will be our final day to turn her off and uh, say bye to Foxy. If you haven't met her, go meet her. Wonderful conversationalist and. That's all there is to it, right there. So next Sunday we're gonna be at the Donk House. Watch our Instagram, watch our website if you're if you're not familiar with where it's at, or if you need directions, or where exactly we're going to be. Donk House is just three blocks north of where we're at right now. Wonderful space for kids, wonderful place for adults. It's going to be a phenomenal Sunday. We're going to market again. We're going to kind of advertise and, and blanket the community, invite them all out. Kind of like relaunching Dark to our neighborhood again. So it's going to be going to be a good Sunday. All right, now you ready for the word? Yes. yes. All right. I, in all in all sermonic honesty, I got to just be honest with you here today. I really struggled with how to title this particular topic, this particular talk today. I went between a couple different titles. The first one was, I want you. That's kind of like God speaking to you, you know, like the old army motto, I want you for the U.S. Army, right? I want you. And I also struggled with, maybe we can go with that one, or maybe we can go with the A, B, Cs. I really, really struggled, but we're kind of going to use both, all right? So if you are a note taker, you can write down, I want you, in quotes, and then maybe backslash and just put the A, B, Cs. I want you. How many know it's nice to feel wanted? It's nice to feel needed, right? In college... I'll, I'll share, you, share an example here. In college, I, I was part of this um, traveling PR team. They called us a drama team. We, none of us acted at all. We just didn't mind looking like ridiculously foolish in front of a group of people. So they said, hey, you're going to be on the drama team. You're going to travel around to different youth camps, and you're going to go and promote our school. I'm like, are you sure you want me and all these histrionic individuals to go represent the school? And they're like, yeah, we want you on the team. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to be on the team. So I traveled around full-time in college, all throughout my summer, would go from one camp to the next, to the next, to the next, just marketing our school, PR for our school. Well, I did that for two straight solid years. It was awesome, and then my third year, they invited me back to do it again. And this year, the director of, the, of this particular uh, team, PR team, drama team, whatever it was, said, hey, David, I, you know what? I want you to be the leader. Of, of one of the teams. I, I want you to be, they call them the president. I want you to be the president of this particular drama team. And I said, look, Professor Moore, that's not for me. I'm not the guy to lead. As, as not. And she said, David, you're the man for the job for this time. I, I think you're the guy. I want you in that position. I want you in that position. I says, Linda Moore, you, no, 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 I, I'm not the man. And finally, reluctantly, I agreed. I said, all right, I'm in. I'm going to do it. And I said, I don't think I'm right for the job, right? I'm like going to be leading all my peers, all my friends, and I don't think they're going to listen to me. I don't think they're going to respect me. I don't think I have the leadership capability to lead this team effectively. And she said, David, you do. I endow you with all the power I have. You're going to be the leader of the team. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So we go. Week one on the on this particular tour that we were on, we go to we go to the cornfields of Nebraska. Any Nebraska people in the room? Yeah, I didn't think so. Not a, not a whole lot of there except for cornfields. So we go to the cornfields of Nebraska. We show up 
to this campground in the middle of a cornfield with a Tyson chicken factory right across the street. It smelled awful. If the wind blew a certain way, it was just the worst smell you'd ever smelled in your entire life. We show up to this campground. We finished week one. We made it. It was awesome. We were going to be there for a second straight week. And over the weekend, we had nothing going on. And we're a bunch of college kids. And we're just thinking, all right, what are we going to do? So me being the leader of the team, I say, hey, look, across the street, there's a parked train. Just a train, box cars lined up over there. And I look at all my team like, hey, you guys want to go train hopping? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, let's go train hopping. He's the leader. Why not do that? So we go. It's dark. It's like 8, 9 o'clock at night. We go over there with nothing to do. There's no food around. There's only one restaurant in the entire town. The restaurant is called Restaurant. The food is terrible. We've got nowhere to go, nothing to do. So we go to the train. We start hopping over car, uh, box, bo uh, uh, train. What do they call Box cars on this train. We go hopping from one end to the other, back and forth. It was dark. We didn't think anybody could see us, right? So... <laughs> We get the cops call on us. So we, <laughs> the cops come, whoop, whoop, we're up, so we go running. We go running. Now we're good Christian safe. Peter's a Christian college. We're good Christian <laughs> safe, all right? And we go running from, from the police. And we go running back to the campground where we were on this particular day. If you're going to run, don't go back to the place where you, they're going to rat you out anyway. So we go back to the campground. <laughs> we go to this particular playground where they had a bunch of tire swings. We go hiding in the tire swings. Ironically, this is what's crazy. The cops come onto the campground. We're hiding in kids' tire swings and tire tubes and on the playground and in the slides and anywhere we could find. We'd go hiding from the police. They look for us for a solid hour and we're just hiding and like hunker down in there. And somehow they left. They didn't, they never caught us, never found us. But the director of the camp came to us and he's like, I know what you did. <laughs> oh gosh. And so he's like, you need to call your school. You need to make it right. And you need to even see if you're going to be back for week two. <laughs> so I call my director. I'm like, Professor Moore, I told you I wasn't the right man for the job. I'm not the guy you needed for the job. And she, we told her the whole story. She was like, David, I'm disappointed in you. I'm very disappointed in you. But I still think you're the man for the job to lead the rest of the summer. I want you in this role. I want you in this particular position. How many know it's just good to feel wanted, good to feel needed, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's kind of what we have going on when we come to Mark chapter number 6. We are in a series in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 6, we're going to come to uh, verses 7 through 13, a little, uh, a small passage of scripture, but that's kind of what we have. Jesus kind of pre presenting to us this idea that he wants you he wants you. He wants to use you. He wants to work in you. He wants to work through you. He wants to do phenomenal things in your life. That's what we have as we come to Mark chapter 6. We'll pick it up in verse 7. Are you ready? Yes. Come on. I said you ready. Yes. Verse 7 says this. And he called. This is Jesus. Called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. Everybody say two by two. Two by two. And gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Also translated demons. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no carbs, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Verse 12. So they went out. And they proclaimed that people should repent. Verse 13. And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. Can we pray together today? Father, in the, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just pray that you would speak to us through the power of your word. Change our lives, change our families, change our community. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Everybody, would you just turn to your neighbor? Get off on their face. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. I want you. It's kind of creepy, right? If you don't know your neighbor, it's kind of weird. Kind of weird. Turn to your other neighbor. Turn to your other neighbor now, the one you probably did not pick. Your number two, your option number two, say, neighbor, I want you. Now, would you just end it with a wink? Just wink at him real creepily. I want you. Real creepy. Real creepy. Just wink, you know. I love, whenever I do something I know my wife didn't like, I just wink at him. Yeah, there we go. Winking makes everything all better all the time. <laughs> it's not true. So last week, right, my wife preached about Jesus going home. He went to his hometown. He's been out and about 
traveling about, preaching the gospel, casting out demons, healing the sick. He's been going about all around doing all these phenomenal things. And now Jesus is like, you know what, disciples, I'm going to go home. So he goes to his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth was a town of about three to five hundred people. It was a small town. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was in everybody's business. Everybody knew everybody. So Jesus goes home. He goes to his hometown knowing the needs of the people there. He's like, I know, I know this person. I know my neighbor needs this. I know that person needs a new job. I know the needs. I know the community. I know my hometown. And he goes home. And he is met with opposition saying, who is this guy? Who's, the, who's this guy? Who, th who does he think he is? G who does he think he's God? They're like, isn't that, isn't that like the son of Joseph? Isn't that just the carpenter? Isn't that son of the virgin Mary? This dude is nothing. And he's coming in trying to heal me, trying to heal my family, trying to cast out demons from my... And he's met with this opposition where he is not welcome in his own hometown. And he makes the same. He's like, you know, a prophet... A man of my stature is not even welcome in his own hometown. He's not even welcome. Look at what he says in Mark chapter 6. I think we've got it on the screen. He says, And he could do no mighty work. He could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. This is the power of unbelief. The power that if you fail to believe in the one who has the power to do something in your life, whether you're whether for all things being equal. Whether you believe or whether you disbelieve, you're right. Have you ever thought about that? Whether you disbelieve or whether you believe, you're right. If you believe Jesus can do a work in your life, you will see Jesus do unbelievable, miraculous things in your life. If you disbelieve the power of Jesus to do something in your life, you're also right. Because he will then be limited to do what he could do or what he wants to do in your life. He was not welcome in his own home town. This is the power of unbelief. Can I just encourage you as we dive into this particular passage? I believe, and I, I don't believe, I know God wants to do a work in you. God wants to do a work. God delights in doing miracles for you. God delights in doing things in you. He delights in doing things through you. God is a God. Jesus is Lord. He is the God who loves to do things for you. Can I get a hearty amen? Amen. 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 amen, amen. Jesus, God wants oh God, you. God, I want God. you is what Jesus is saying to you today. But now we're going to transition. All right, here's my title too. The ABCs of doing Jesus ministry. The ABCs. We're going to give you A, B, and C. A stands for authority. Everybody say authority. Authority. A, authority has been given to you. Look at it in verse number 7. He says this, And he called the twelve. And began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. This right here, ladies and gentlemen, is exciting news. That you have been given the authority of Jesus Christ, the one, the one who sits on the throne. He's been given, you've been given the authority over, over unclean spirits, over demonic possession. You have been given the same power, the same authority that Jesus walked to this planet with. He is now endowed it upon you. He has given it to you. This is the most exciting thing. And we often have this mentality of, ah, who am I? I'm nobody. And you're right. You are nobody except by the grace of God himself, except for the grace of Jesus Christ. He has now given you the authority on high. And look at what Jesus does. He calls the twelve. He looks at the 12, right? His road dogs, his posse, his crew, all 12 of them. And he says, I'm now giving you authority. He began to send them out two by two. Everybody say two by two. Two, two by two. two. And gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Two by two. This is awesome. This is like the two first. Two by two. The, yes, two by two. The first dynamic duo, right? It wasn't. It wasn't, who was the, the, the Lone Ranger and Tonto? They weren't the first dynamic duo, right? Batman and Robin. This was the disciples going out two by two. This gives us great insight into doing Jesus ministry. The ABCs of doing Jesus ministry. This gives us incredible insight in that when you go out alone, or maybe better yet, I should say, when you go out in a pair, when you go out two by two, it strengthens ministry. 
It strengthens your effectiveness in ministry. When you're out and about in your workplace, when you're out and about in your family, and you're the only believer, or perhaps there's only a few believers, it strengthens ministry when you can go out two by two. This is what Jesus is saying. I'm sending you out now two by two. There's a strength that happens. There's an encouragement that happens when you can go out into our community. Like yesterday, when we go out to I Love My City, there's a, a, a strength that can happen when we go out in force and we say, we're going to conquer this neighborhood. We're going to go out. We're going to be used by God to do something miraculous. It's like uh, any any fitness people in the room. It's like when you go training, right? And you got a training uh, buddy or a training partner who's there to wake you up at five o'clock in the morning and say, "Let's get to the gym, right? Let's wake up. Let's get to the gym." It's really really hard to get there when you're on your own, right? It's like I'm, I, I I probably wouldn't go if I didn't have somebody pushing me to get there. It's Jesus is now sending them out two by two. Look at what look at what the Old Testament says in Ecclesiastes chapter four. Uh, verse 9 says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Find that person. Find that other person in your life, in your sphere of influence, in your workplace, in your family. Find that person that is a believer. Cling to them. Look to them for encouragement, right? Look to them for, for when you're discouraged, for when you need God to do something in your life. Look to that person to, so that when you are in your workspace, when you're in your family, when you're in your sphere of influence, you can find that encouragement. Jesus sends them out two by two. And look at what he does. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. We've talked about this often. Uh, Jesus dealt with, like, as we read through Mark, right, he dealt with so many sick people, and he dealt with so many demon-possessed people. And it's really interesting to me because there are no more demons than there were in Jesus' day. Demons don't procreate, right? They don't multiply. It's not like they're getting together, having hookups, and they're multiplying demons. That's not what's happening here, right? It's not, that's not what's going on. There's as many demons as there were in Jesus' day as there are today. And I can just probably suggest to you today that there are as many, if not more, perhaps demon-influenced individuals. I could even go as far as to say demon-possessed or demonly charged people in our day and age. So why did Jesus deal with so many demon-possessed people, and yet we, in our today day and culture, we just kind of like name stuff, and then we try to medicate it, right? We try to like name it, oh, that person, they're, they're, they're uh, and I'm not trying to be crude, but like they're a psychopath, or they've got this disease, or they've got that disease, and we try to medicate it with things, where in reality, as a believer, we have the spirit of Jesus living in us. Where we can immediately, that spirit inside of us can call out a spirit inside of somebody else and say, you know what, that is not of the Lord. That is not of Jesus. And I call you out and I cast you out. Jesus dealt with so many demon-possessed individuals. And I think it's prudent for us to say not to go looking for a demon under every single chair, over under every single whatever. We don't need to go saying that person's demon-possessed or there. And you don't, you, that's, it's just going to get weird really, really quick. But I think it's prudent for you and I as believers to say, you know what, the spirit inside of me recognizes that the spirit inside of you or inside of that person is not of the Lord. And you can call that out. This is really, really interesting that Jesus gave the disciples authority and power over the unclean spirits. This is really, really encouraging because for you and I, in today's day and age, did you know we have that same power? The same power, the moment you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, is the moment that power is now endowed upon you. You have the power over unclean spirits. You have the power to say, you know what, the spirit inside of me now recognizes the spirit inside of that or the spirit over that or whatever it is, you can call it out. And you have power and authority to heal people, to put your hands on them, and to call out that sickness in their life. So when so, And I love this. When people come to me as a pastor, I'm like, Pastor, pray for me. I'm dealing with whatever, whatever sickness, whatever ailment in my body, and I love it. I try to remind myself, even this week as people come to me and say, Pastor, pray for me, pray for my pray for my, my mom, my dad, my whoever, pray for me. I can remind myself, I have the power now that Jesus gave me to lay hands on that person and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And all I, and, 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 there's, there's nothing about me, there's nothing, about, you have that same power. So the next time someone comes to you and says, pray for me, pray for me, pray for my whatever, pray for my dog, pray for my mom, pray for whoever, you can. You have the power and the authority to lay your hands on that person and build up your faith and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. You have the power. You have the authority. Isn't that a good news? Yes. A, authority. 
B. Everybody say B. B. It stands for believe. Believe that God will provide what you need. Let's look at it in verse number 8. And this is Jesus talking. He said, He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals and to put two and to not put on two tunics. All right, we got to get real here. How many, <laughs> you're going on a trip and you are the classic overpacker? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm real over high so we know who to avoid. <laughs> we don't want you on our trip. Raise it, come on, raise it up, raise it up. Uh, we got it, we got it. Overpackers, overpacker, right? The, the whole idea of overpacking, and I'm not an overpacker, I'm an underpacker. I pack last minute and I just throw stuff in a bag, zip it up, all right, let's go. All right, we're good to go. Right, at least I got clothes, so we're good to go. All right, so like the overpacker, right? They're like, you know what? They're gonna have options, right? My wife is the classic overpacker. She's gotta have options for what if it rains? Or what if it, you know, we're going to Florida. What if it snows? It's not gonna snow in Florida. Or what if the wind blows? Or what if there's a tornado? Or what if we wanna go swimming? Or what if I wanna wear that outfit? Or what if we're gonna go on a date and I wanna wear that outfit? Or what if I put this outfit on and I like the way it looks at me, I feel bloated that day, so I wanna put on another outfit? Or what if it, 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 it's, it's whatever, what if, what if, what if? Classic over Packers. Now, last time we traveled as a family, not to name any names whatsoever, I want to show you a picture of how unbelievably crazy this overpacking can get. Come this picture up on the screen here for me. This is, we're just traveling to Orlando, Florida, and let's just count what we have here going on. This is, this is the only thing in the picture. We've got one bag down here, one, two, we've got 15 car seats, because we never know when we're going to need any kind of car seat. And this is not even showing you all the like carry-on bags that my wife had. She had a backpack, she had a purse, she had a tote, she had something else for snacks, she had something else for the kids, she had all these different things, right? So all in all, we probably had like 10 bags going on all together. Classic overpacking, and not to name any names here, but classic overpacking. And what is overpacking, what does it all stem from? It all stems from this, these two words, what if. Well, what if? What if I need that? What if I have to have this? What if this arises? What if a situation? What if we don't have enough diapers? What if we don't have enough wipes? What if we go to the beach? What if we don't go to the beach? What if we go to the pool? What if we go out to eat? What if we stay in to eat? What if, what if, what if? And can I tell you this? As Jesus, as we go back and read what he says, he says, take nothing for your journey. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no, ba no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear a sandal and not to put on two tunics. He's like, bring nothing. Take no food. Take no money. See ya. Have a nice trip. Go out two by two and just hope you make it, right? Have a great trip. And what, what is Jesus saying in this entire thing? He's called. What's his calling? What, what's he saying to us through this particular scripture? He's saying to travel light and to know to believe that he will provide everything you need. Amen? Amen? Jesus will provide what you need. So that when you are out and about, when you are in your workplace, the classic things that we all come up with, right? Jesus has called us. He's positioned us in our workplace to be the light of the world in that particular space. And our immediate question is, well, what if I shine the light? What if I share people the love of Jesus. What if I go out on a limb and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, pe I'm gonna tell people I'm a Christian, or I go to church, or whatever. What if I do that and they don't want anything to do with me? Or what if they ostracize me? Or what if they don't like me? Or what if they disagree with me? Or what if I gotta debate them now? Or what if, what if, what if? Can I just tell you the what if? in our life it just kills ministry it kills your effectiveness in ministry it's really really cool because in this particular passage what we're seeing is that jesus will not only provide what you need he will provide everything you need but even if you're like in that situation and you're like you know what jesus isn't coming through i'm not hearing from god i don't feel like he's providing jesus can provide exactly not only what you need but he can provide what they need as well here's an example you guys are all incredibly kind. You know, you will often come to me at the end of a sermon of a pastor. That was a great sermon. This is what God spoke to me. And I'm like, I don't remember saying that, but that's awesome. That's cool that God spoke to you in that regard. And this is what this means for us. 
that Jesus will often, although I, I feel like God's got a word he can speak through me, God will often take my words and translate them into something that you're hearing and something that is speaking directly into your life for that moment. God can take scripture and illuminate it to you in such a different way that I even spoke it or said it because Jesus will provide not only what I need, not only what you need, but he will provide what they need as well. He will give you the miracle of speaking. He will give them the miracle of hearing as well. Believe that as you are out, believe that as you have the authority to cast out demons, believe as you have the authority to call out sickness from people, believe as Jesus has called you to be the light of the world, you have the authority to do that. Now you can believe that Jesus will provide everything that you need in that moment. You don't have to worry about what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What, am I, what if they disagree with me? What if, what if, what if? You don't have to worry about that because in that moment you can believe you have the authority and that Jesus will provide everything you need. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Number C, or not number C, letter C, A, B, C. C stands for confidence. Everybody say confidence. Confidence. Confidence knowing that God will work through you. Confidence knowing that God will work through you. This is really encouraging to me because we, you and I, we are we are part of God's, um, we're part of His redemptive plan. His plan for the world was now the church. His plan for the world was you and was me. We are part of God's redemptive plan. So we can have confidence knowing that God will work through us. And here's the beautiful thing is that we can have confidence knowing that God has already, the, per, the people that God has placed in our life, in your life, you can look around your world right now, and you can say, you know what, the people that are in my life, God has already been working on their heart long before I ever came along. God is, and I would even go as far as to make a bold suggestion and say this, that God, there is no person that you're going to come in contact with that God hasn't already been working on their heart. And, and I, know, I know the immediate question is, well, what about the atheists? Or what about the person on like the farthest reach of like the Indonesian islands? What about that? What about what about those people? You don't know their heart. I don't know their heart. You don't know how God may have been working in their heart long before that missionary or long before you came along in their life. Right? We can often just kind of stand back and like label a person or an individual. They look tough. They look hard. Or they're an atheist. They don't want to know what I have to say. They wouldn't believe me. They just want to debate. Right? We have all these different things, right? But we don't know what God has already been doing in their heart long before you or I came along. We're part of the plan. So we can have confidence knowing that there's no person that we come in contact with that God has not already been working. Look at verse 10. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. This is like nuts, right? These are people they don't know. They never met before. And Jesus is saying, well, just go to the town and find, find, find somebody. Find a home and just stay there, right? This is nuts. But this is God's provision for you and for I. Go there until you leave that town. Verse 11. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Jesus just shoots straight with them. He understands there's people that don't want him. He understands there's people that don't like Jesus, he, that don't even like him. He understands this whole idea that there are people out there who are going to oppose him and oppose you. And you're like, yeah, those are the people I'm worried about. And you're like, no, no, no. Don't worry about the people that will say no. If you worry about the people that are all going to oppose you, you're going to miss all the people that would say yes or that will come or that will experience the life transformative work of Jesus in their life. Verse 12. So they went out and they proclaimed that people should repent. Everybody say repent. repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and he healed them. Authority has been given to you. It's been given to me. It's been given to us. We have the power. I got the power. We've got the power. We've got the authority from Jesus himself to walk this earth, to walk our sphere of influence, to walk our workspace, 
to walk our family, to walk amongst our community with the authority that Jesus walked this earth with. We have that same power, that same authority. And you can definitely believe that as you have that power, as you have that authority, you can believe that Jesus will provide everything you need in the moments where you step out on a limb and you step out in faith and say, I'm going to be a light to this world. And you begin to proclaim the goodness and the love of Jesus. You can believe in those moments Jesus will provide everything you need. And then the third thing is you can simply have confidence knowing that God is going to work through you. You don't have to worry about what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What if they disagree? Don't worry. Confidence knowing that God is going to work through you. With that, can I charge you with this? Can I just simply say in the name of Jesus, minister to your sphere of influence. Go. Go with the power of Go with the authority that Jesus has already given you, knowing that I can walk into my home today. And depending on what your home looks like, if there are unbelievers there, you can walk in with the same authority, the same power. You can believe God's going to do something in you and through you. You can have confidence knowing that things are going to change because you have that same power, that same authority. In the name of Jesus, go. I charge you, go and minister to your sphere of influence. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together today.